Good evening, everyone. It's 5 p.m. on 18th October 2020, and we are kicking off today's session. A warm welcome to all of you. This is Sujata, the founder uh, and chief curator of My Learning Ladder and moderator for today's session as well. We have Tala Salaria with us today to speak to us about a few aspects of the laws uh, relevant from a common woman, common man's perspective. We do hope to have uh, deeper dive sessions for some of these topics that we will touch upon today sometime soon. So before we move ahead a little about my learning ladder, especially for those of you who are joining in for the first time, uh, all of us today have abundant access to information and this is available literally at our fingertips as well, thanks to internet, the world of web, podcast, YouTube and various such. But we are also a 20 generation and fast moving to just a minute generation. I was tempted to say just 60 minutes, but I guess we're just going to get to just a minute soon. And we also want to learn everything uh, within the shortest possible time with least amount of effort. So MLN, which is my learning ladder, addresses part of these needs, but more importantly, brings together uh, passionate knowledge givers and keen learners. So each of our coaches and speakers, including the one today, are people with passion who are interested in the subject they are here to talk to us about or coach us about and are doing this mostly, mostly beyond their day job. We are able to give you distilled information and pearls of their knowledge in the form of small nuggets, which you can consume. And I won't hold you back uh, and I won't come in between you and Talha, but just a few ground rules. Uh, your mic mics are muted, if I'm not mistaken, and videos are off so that we have an effective session. Feel free to put down your questions in the chat window and I'll pick it up and use it for the Q&A to Talha at the end of our session. Uh, today's session is about, and I won't say all about, but a little about legal basics and rights every Indian should know. So let me start with an Akbar Birbal story. So one day Akbar asked Birbal, what would you choose if given a choice between justice and one gold coin? Birbal chooses the gold coin. Akbar is shocked. Others of course think Birbal is an idiot and very happy in a way thinking uh, that Birbal has brought this upon himself. So on being asked by Akbar, why did you choose the, the gold coin? Birbal has one thing to say. He says, we usually ask for something which we don't have. And you've seen that in our country, justice is available in abundance. That's usual Birbal. So since justice is already available to me and I'm always short of money, I said I would choose the gold coin. Well, Birbal did end up getting in the story a thousand gold coins. Now, I don't know what's crossing your mind. What would you choose? But coming to our topic, uh, whether we understand the legal and the judicial system in its entirety or not, a little bit of knowledge and education is very important in our day-to-day -day lives. It not only helps us understanding and tackling situations a little better, but especially in times of panic, and believe you me, I have been through some of these, uh, you are better placed. So be it an accident or be it uh, planning what you leave behind, how you leave behind, a little bit of knowledge always helps. So some of the laws uh, we perhaps are already aware of, you see, I've put down there some for you to just go through. Uh, I know some of you must be feeling, hey, this I know, this I don't know, but at least there are a couple there, which uh, for some of us are a first time revelation. And I would like to, at this stage, tell you all that this is a very vast subject, impossible to scratch the surface in 60 minutes, but we will touch upon the basics of three to five areas we think are very critical and depending on time, we will cover anywhere between three to five topics. And I would like to acknowledge that uh, some of us here perhaps know a lot already. So this is going to be repetitive for you. And with that preamble, let me introduce the session coach for today, Sala Salaria. And bear with me for this slightly deep introduction because Tala is such a person who deserves this. So Talha is the founder of Law, which is L-A-W, Lawyers at Work, which is a full service corporate commercial law firm based in Bangalore, 
with domestic and international operations in varied sectors such as education, logistics, infrastructure, retail, IT, and manufacturing, so fairly vast. She's been a corporate lawyer for nearly two decades, represented companies across a wide range of industries, represented entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, private equity investors. She began her career with Jay Sagar and Associates and also was a co-founder at MMB Legal. Now, Talha has worked in the Indian private equity markets and has been acclaimed as an expert in structuring private equity transactions in India. She is also, she is also listed as one of India's leading practitioners in the internet and e-commerce industries. Um, she's frequently called upon by educational institutions uh, and various industrial bodies to address people, to conduct workshops, uh, and also to be part of seminars. So she has in the past also had brief secondments uh, with various law firms in Germany, Switzerland, Vienna, Sweden, and recently also appointed as an officer of International Franchising Committee of the International Bar Association. Well, now on a personal front, Talha loves impacting the society and currently is working on solid waste management product for Bengaluru City and also working very closely. And I think this is uh, a subject uh, she thinks through her heart uh, and also through her head. She's working very closely to rehabilitate uh, trafficked girls and women. She was the forerunner and did a fair amount of work to send migrants home during the initial days of the COVID crisis. Her personality extends very beautifully um, to other aspects of life as well. She is an NLS grad, NLS Bangalore alum and hails from Kashmir. And guess what? She loves grocery shopping. So she's a shopaholic, but loves shopping and going to all grocery stores. She is also an avid trekker who climbs mountain um, with ease. So you can call her a mountain goat. So welcome, Talha, to today's session. And I would have not done justice had I skipped some of those points, though I did skip a couple. Uh, but welcome to today's session. And over to you for a quick hello before I put forward the first question. Thanks, Sujata. Thank you so much for a very long and very complimentary introduction. I'm not sure if I'm so deserving, but thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here actually today and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I was excited to do the session because it also helps us in brushing up things and kind of I always do corporate law mostly, but uh, these topics are dear to everybody and they impact each and every person. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Tela, and welcome. So let's start from the corporate, uh, which means we all talk about succession planning when it comes to our workplace. I remember long documents, who will take over from whom, uh, various things, uh, including our own businesses if we are entrepreneurs. But seldom, maybe it's picking up, but uh, we, we don't do the same things at home. So who's a nominee, who's a legal heir? How do we go about organizing things for smooth succession of things belonging to oneself or wealth created by oneself. That is the first uh, mm -hmm. subject or topic uh, I would like you to address um, and tell us whatever you can or the key four or five things one must be aware of and do effectively to ensure a smooth succession of our own things. Okay, so um, I think the first thing that we should be mindful of, which I always ask when someone says I want to make a will is when you're talking about property, essentially immovable property, whether it is self-acquired property or ancestral property, this is not so relevant in the context of, uh, you know, succession planning is also based on your religion, as you know, the Hindus, Muslims, all have different laws. Uh, but in, in case of um, uh, what happens is in case of, I'll focus on the Hindu succession law right now. Ancestral property is where you go back four generations of male lineage. So your father, your father's father, father's father. So anything which you got prior to that is ancestral. Anything post that is self-acquired. Now what happens with ancestral property is that it goes under the Hindu Succession Act, which is basically that it will go in the manner where the Hindu law is uh, provided and it will get bifurcated in that way. Uh, whenever there is self-acquired property, and mostly now we see self-acquired itself, whenever I ask the question, it's mostly self-acquired. What happens is that um, for uh, Christians, Parsis, Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, and Sikhs, 
uh, you come under the Indian Succession Act, uh, where there are two ways. One is what you call interstate, which is if a person has basically passed away without a will. So that is interstate succession. And the other is testamentary succession. These are, this is legal uh, language, but testamentary basically means there is a will. And um, uh, the will is basically a testamentary document. So there are two ways that uh, inheritance happens when it is interstate and when it is testamentary. I always tell people, no matter whether you're young or old, etc., please make your will. Because if it is not, uh, if, if there is no will, then you have to go as per the Hindu succession, uh, sorry, as per the uh, Indian Succession Act, where you will have to go to court, the court will have to appoint an administrator, the by way of something called a letter of administration, etc, where basically you will have to go through a longer process. And the court and the administrator will figure out will, will basically implement the principles of the uh, Indian Succession Act and then decide who gets how much. Um, therefore, it is always better to have a will in place, which is the, uh, once you have a will in place, it, it becomes effective on the, after the person passes away. And now you would have heard people saying, oh, should I register a will? Should I not? You know, a will is so easy to make. There is no format required. You can do it on plain paper. There is no stamping required. It's as easy as that. I can sit down right now while we talk and I can do a will. There are a couple of things which are important. Um, which is basically you have to be of sound mind when you make the will. Therefore, always what people do to be careful is they uh, get a doctor's certificate so that that doesn't get challenged, you know, from a practical perspective. You also have to write very clearly your intent. What is a will? A will is a document of intent. What did I want to do with my property? So the more clear you are, for example, if I want to disinherit, disinherit my son, Rather than not mentioning his name at all and in that, I can write there that I don't want to give him any property. And this is the reason I don't want to give him because I just don't want to give him or give a reason. So then the intent becomes very clear. Um, thirdly, I would say when you sign on the document or even a thumb impression is fine if someone wants to do that, give, give it with a flourish. Like, you know, th these things are important. When you go to court, Someone will say that the biggest two reasons why a will gets challenged is basically they say either it's fraudulent or there is coercion. Now, when you write, write all the details in the will and you write it very nicely and explain, um, you know, the intent becomes clear. And you, if you've given your signature, which is not shaky, all these things the court actually looks into and shows, you know, was he forced? Why is the signature like this, etc.? So that is important. And then you must have two witnesses. So even if someone is touch wood on their deathbed, as long as you, they can do a will right there as well. As long as the doctor can say they are of sound, sound mind, that they can think clearly. Um, you know, you have two witnesses. Those two witnesses who should be there should not be ones typically who are beneficiaries or who are interested because obviously then there will be a conflict of interest. So. What I'm trying to say here is that I've briefly told you how if you don't get a will, you have to go through an entire process. If you have a will, it's very clear. And that's how easy it is to make a will. So I would urge everyone to immediately kind of get a will together. Um, you would have also, I'm just going forward, you would have also heard uh, mention of probate, probate, a will needing to be probated. Okay, What probate essentially means is that you take the will to a court and it is a conclusive evidence of basically the legitimacy of the will. So once you take it to court, the court probates it. That means the will is valid and then the executor can implement the will. Now, pro probating a will is not essential unless um, it is basically the property is located in either Calcutta, Bombay or Chennai, the immovable property, or the person is residing there. In that case, it is essential, I must mention, for Hindus, Buddhists, Sikhs, Sikhs and Jains, Christians don't need to probate their will. Uh, Muslim law, I could touch upon, but um, it's completely different from all of these. Um, there's also, I'll just, I'll, I'll basically mention what happens is when you, if, if you have an interstate and if you haven't made a will, what will happen is the there is a classification. So if I am a, say, male Hindu, if I just to give an example, if I'm a male Hindu and I did not make a will, what happens is that there are different classes of heirs. 
there's a class one ad, there's a class two ad, then there's a class three ad. Uh, so the uh, the property will go. So for example, for class one as the property gets divided equally. For class two as they will see first who's the first person. There's an order of precedence. It will go to them. So for example, class one as is quite straightforward. It'll be so if the male has passed away, it'll be his wife. It'll be his son. I mean, basically kids, son, daughter. It'll be his mother. And if there are any kids who have passed away. then their kids as well so all of those guys will be the class 1s and they will get the property equally similarly for a female what happens is if i'm i'm a hindu female who has who's who's passed away without a will i will basically um who will inherit it is my husband my kids uh, including if any kids have passed away before predeceased etc or otherwise if there is nobody then it goes to the husband's heirs so it's better to actually make the will yes that's what it is unless i got the property from my father and then it will go to my father's heirs so you see the implication so uh, you know, of it gets attached it gets automatically attached in the absence yes. of will yes absolutely so because they will have to follow because there was no will so then i just um, want to uh, ask you one thing here uh, maybe i miss uh, so if there is no will there is a certain order in which other acts take over so is it the indian uh, succession acts takes over then the religious acts or what is that order it will be the indian succession act that will take over the acts are not in priority it will be as per the indian succession act but under the indian succession act if i was to pass away they say okay this lot of people will be entitled to the property okay. first and in this case it will be equal after that if there's nobody say if i don't have any family nothing okay it'll be the class 2 as which is the next lot where what happens is then you start going into husband's relatives father's relatives all of that um, you know um, even in muslims what happens is if uh, if unfortunately if if i'm i'm a muslim female and i have uh, and and my kid has passed away before me actually her kids or his kids don't get the property so there are a few of these very unfair kind of provisions right. so it's very important to kind of uh, to get Simply the will just do the will and get on and make so it easy for your next of kin in a way yes, absolutely because that gets otherwise contested and what happens is even uh, for example if i was talking about say a okay if it's so this is immovable property for example right. now you have uh shares or you have a bank account or you have you know typically what do we have we have fds we have cash in bank we have jewelry we have uh shares we have insurance so what happens is that in all of those we very happily put the name of the nominee yeah. thinking okay isko milega but what happens is that it's only in case of the insurance that the money will actually go to the nominee in everybody else's case they are like basically they're not your legal heirs per se they are your legal representatives who hold it in trust for you depending on them it's their responsibility once the will is there and they studies they have to basically ensure that the money goes to those people for example uh, recently we didn't have a, a bank account nominee so i'm just give you an example where i forgot to put nominee for an account not me my father and then when he passed away they said you don't have a nominee so we had to go and get what is called a succession certificate which is not like probate but you have to go to court everyone has to give an noc then you have to say look i am the legal heir for this person for this bank account so i will then then the court has to give the succession certificate for that one account imagine then i will go and i will give it to the bank the bank will accordingly then give me the money right so in this simple case tala what i hear you say is make a will make it simple but at the same time nominating or putting down nominees in each of your other as assets is equally important because if one is there without the other you anyway end up doing more work yeah because the your formalities your uh, work work i mean your uh, documentation and all of that becomes more that's all it is lovely so um, other than the insurance what i heard you say everywhere else we are just holder or temporary holders of that particular form of wealth or asset and god help us if we have we are those and we've spent it then we have to pay back the legal heirs interesting interesting so uh, suppose another question just on the will tala to you suppose one has not made the will and is breathing or you know you're you're just passing on and passing away 
Uh, I heard you say you don't, it doesn't need registration. So you just need to keep four or five things in mind and do the will and we are good with it. Is that? Yeah. Possible? So if you're sure of your will, one of the things you can do is register it. You may have heard. Uh, what happens is if I'm sure I'm passing away or something, just to ensure that there are no claims and you know other things, if you register the will, then that's another step you've taken to confirm the fact that, look, this is my final will. Uh, but you can also change. It's not like you are just because you register the will. It's not like you um, cannot then change your will. It is advisable thereafter also to register the next one. So I think registration, what happens is you would do it later when you kind of know more or less that, you know, you're certain about the will and who you want to give it to. Um, because otherwise you are, you can always bring in the later will, which is amended, but then one is registered. Then the question in the court's mind is then why would they register it? If they were so sure, was there coercion, was there fraud, was there something else? Uh, so that was one of the other aspects that we should keep in mind. Right. So a registered earlier will, does it hold more water or in the court of law than a non-registered later date will? No, it won't, but the... It'll just become more tedious. Actually, the later will is the one which will hold most ground. But then you have to make sure that there is no doubt. Like even if I it came to me, I would say, okay, they had just registered the will. Now they've got this. What happened? Sure. You know, if, especially if there's a lot of property involved and there's some content. Like if, if it's not amicable, it's definitely a question that the court will go into. Great. Uh, so one related question to this, Tala, is uh, it's not yet applicable in India, I'm, um, to the best of my knowledge, the inheritance tax. But mm -hmm. in the Western world, uh, in US and all, for example, whatever you in inherit is also taxed. So would you like to tell us two, three tips on how do we take care of um, you know, what we leave behind? How can we minimize the tax that the people pay? once we leave behind the so There are many ways. I'm not a tax expert though, but one is that there is going to be, there is some form of a wealth tax, which is there. Um, and what people do is like you would have heard in the US, they set up the trusts. Yes. Uh, which are basically either you ring fence, which means that tomorrow, if you think, especially, you know, corporate, like if there's a CEO, etc., what they do is they try to ring fence. So they give their assets to the trust so that then they are not holding it. And the beneficiaries can be your family. So there are very complicated structures, actually, which are put in place where, in fact, this doesn't come to you directly as well. The inheritance tax, the trust becomes like estate planning, right? Your um, estate trust, where they have structures where you kind of assign. So the trust then holds the holds your property. So you can do very significant tax planning through trust structures, which is really catching up now in India a lot. Right. Like I've had many of my clients actually ask, can we can we set up trust for all of this? And it's helped. It also helps because then it's very clear. It means you get a trustee where whether you stay or not, you don't need to get into all of these details and then they put it there beforehand. Right. So those people on the call who have too much to give and leave behind, I guess, should uh, definitely be consulting uh, experts on this. Uh, so th uh, thanks, Tala. Let's, um, I think it's time to take on the next topic. Um, and uh, I would like to, uh, for you to speak about uh, consumer. So consumer is king, is what we've all heard uh, all our lives. But uh, in, in a lighter vein, the king never bargains, leave alone complains. <laughs> On a more serious note, I think when it comes to an issue, uh, including someone like me, I really don't know where to go, right? Uh, we are at mm -hmm. a of And COVID has brought, uh, yeah. fast tracked a bigger E in our lives. Everything is E today. So we are ordering every day some packet or other is delivered. And it's not a coincidence that I think the Consumer Protection Act, which came into force recently, I think after 25 years or 35 years, whatever, this July, it makes things apparently easier for the consumer and also pronounces the rules for goods being sold through e-commerce, which is good uh, in many ways. Uh, but tell us uh, what are the three things or five things uh, family as a unit must know uh, when they are a consumer or when we are a consumer, what are those things to keep in mind? Okay, so actually we had a Consumer Protection Act for a long time, but they have updated that act and brought in a new act last year. 
yeah. which basically what happens is that they have brought in a concept of product liability which was there earlier but not so distinct and clear so now there is very clear product liability law in india which wasn't there earlier they have brought in e-commerce very clearly under the rules in fact the e-commerce rules just came in july this year uh, where they have very clearly said what is a marketplace entity like your amazon or something or another entity which sells online which is inventory based for example a manufacturer who sells their products directly so they've really distinctly said in these laws they have upped the penalties significantly on all of these guys uh, so that helps and they've made a simpler process of dispute resolution they they've kind of cleaned that up a bit so lots of good stuff uh, there are a few things which need to be cleared etc but uh, apart from that the important thing is to remember who's a consumer really when you go on right it is anyone who buys a good or a service for consideration so it can't be a free service um it has to be for consideration and say if i buy it and someone in my household uses it that's also a consumer so the whole family can be a consumer it's not just the person who has bought it it should not be for resale or commercial use it should be for your personal use and it should not be free and now say for example if a minor buys um something online or uh, as a consumer the parent or the legal guardian will have the right to go uh, you know proceed against the uh, the seller or the manufacturer or whatever the case may be and in case of death it will be the legal heir or the legal representative they will have the rights um the rights of consumer have been actually very clearly laid out now that you should be protected against products that are hazardous you should be informed regarding the quality so when i say you should be informed means the sellers have to put in all of this information on their websites i'm i'm i'll talk i'm focused right now more on online rather than offline because you know we are talk- we are in the time that we are where um, right. you know they have to be informed regarding the quality the quantity the purity the standard the price all of that so they have to give very clear indication of exactly what the terms of sale are what will the product look like uh, you know what is its usage etc and then i also have the right to be heard and to a redress or to a forum so that is my right as a consumer well what do you mean when you say unfair trade practice it's basically any deceptiveness which you have put so you know you're putting any false advertisement for example you're claiming something that is wrong or any quality or quantity or performance or something anything regarding that which you did not actually say but it doesn't match up would be something that would be an unfair trade trade practice which would also mean for example selling fake goods there's a lot of that happening online actually that's right. a big concern from an ip intellectual property perspective also so that is one of the things and also if you re- what is an unfair trade practice which is important to all of us is that if you refuse to take back a defective good or you don't refund the consideration if the good wasn't okay within 30 days or within whatever the terms of the website are so actually i have a right to refund within 30 days um that is there and also if you don't give me a bill you know things like this which earlier were just passing on and not giving a bill will be more if i go to a shop etc or if now personal data has become very important we have a lot of legislation coming so if you share my personal data with someone else that's also unfair trade practice now we've got the sense of what are my rights and what is an unfair trade practice the onus is in this case on the seller to prove that what i'm saying is wrong so that is one of the other important things right. under that okay um i can make a complaint for violation of my rights like i said um uh, you know to be protected to be informed etc or if there's a unfair trade practice or if there is a false or misleading act uh you know the goods can be recalled you they have to reimburse me for it um and they can also give me compensation now they've set up an authority you they there is the the um, uh, penalties are uh, both in terms of imprisonment as well as in terms of fine so they're significant they have really gone up i won't go into details of that the one thing to also to remember is that if today i found a good as defective i have 2 years within which i can bring a claim after that it's barred so that is another uh, you know timeline to just uh, put in place um and honestly this is this is actually in addition to any other law so the penalties are ranging right from 10 lakhs to 50 lakhs to um uh, you know imprisonment up to 5 years i have won't go into all of that detail so significant right 
Great. Tana, the act also, since you touched upon the E aspect of the act, there are a couple of uh, the, the you know good points which have come out. One is the jurisdiction. Earlier, uh, you know, it will be where uh, the goods are produced, but apparently this act allows you to actually file it online, which means there is no jurisdiction. Yeah, so you can file it where you reside, so you don't have to get out. You can file it where the business uh, of the person is, or if he, the person has an office, etc., all of that. And you can also file it where the cause of action arose. Um, so you can file it and I mean, you can file it online. What they are trying to say is which, when you say, even if you file it online, you have to file it to a particular authority. So every district has authority. So even though you file it online, you have to decide which authority will you go to. That's what I'm talking about. So right. you would go to, and in terms of um, authorities, there's district which handles up to one crore claims, one to 10 is the state, there's a state forum, and then there is the national forum. So even when you do online, you have to kind of figure out which uh, authority you'll fight. Right. So suppose uh, we find a good defective or say my AC just blows up. So what is the best way to go about it? Do I have to follow a particular protocol, write to the company first and then do whatever else? Or is I can just approach the consumer court? Or what, what, what should I do? So I think what you should do is not approach because while laws are there, it will take a long time. We are still very much in India. Yes. Uh, every person, every seller, so say an Amazon has to put the number of their customer care mm. and a grievance officer. Similarly, a seller also should be putting it. So the moment that there is an issue, you should actually be calling or writing. And I'll tell you, I had got recently, I had just ordered a cake which got delayed. I can't tell you how fast they acted. Within 24 hours, I had my paid bag, cake on my table, everything. Because right. they are aware of the penalties, etc. So it's more of a deterrent. Technically, under law, you are, you can actually, uh, you have to get a confirmation of within 48 hours, they have to confirm receipt of the complaint within 48 hours from the time you file it. And they have to resolve it within 30 days. Awesome. So if it doesn't get done, um, then you would basically uh, go to a forum. I would still say you try to get it done and they are very keen to resolve it. So, because, you know, I mean, I'm not getting into details now, but it's, Everyone in the chain can be responsible. It is the manufacturer, it is the seller, it is the service provider. For example, if someone gives a product which monitors, say, bringing in of ambulances, so the guy who sells that product is responsible. Even the service providers who's providing the service of ambulances is also. Yes. So everyone along the chain will become responsible. So everyone's quite uh, proactive in this one. I have seen at least. So what I hear you say is use law to your advantage. Don't approach or and you know uh, don't practically. Don't, yeah, practically. Yeah. That's all. Not yeah. legally. Yeah, good. And you tell the uh, you tell the company I'm aware of the law. So you please help me and let us settle it between ourselves. That's in so a nutshell. The first thing I would do if I don't hear from them, I'll say 48 hours are over. I haven't heard from you. What are you doing about it? Right, right. Because firstly, you have access also. No, you know how who to reach out to because they have to have a grievance officer and a number to call. Right. So, Tala, there are, uh, I'm sorry, there are a few questions on the chat window which are going back to the will. I think that's, uh, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, I know we are not doing deep dive today. So, uh, if someone, pa if, if husband passes off leaving nothing to the wife, is there anything that can be done by the spouse? That's my understanding of the question. Yeah. So, we just mentioned, no, if it's firstly the question will be, is it Hindu? I'm assuming right now, just for the purposes of discussion, and I'm assuming there is no will. Uh, if both of those are there, actually the wife is entitled. Right. But if there is a will and husband leaves nothing for the wife, then the will takes over. Right. So I'm assuming that's the question. It's come. I mean, questions are coming in privately. Uh, then there is uh, something around. Uh, there is no registered will. And still child, what will happen is you will end up challenging it and you will say, look, something had happened. That's when it will get into context. So right. that is where I'm saying when you draft your will, if you don't want to leave something for the wife, you mentioned that. Wife. Yeah, okay. Just say it. Say, I don't want to leave anything for her and this is the reason. So that then there is no doubt. What will she go on right now? Because it's silent. She may say his relatives have actually kind of, you know, tampered with the will and something, something and you'll get into litigation. Right. And there's one question I think which happens in property always. If you're joint owners and there is no will, 
and one person passes away then does the succession for that person apply and that the half of the property go under the succession or what happens so say father and daughter are part of it no will father passes away what happens does the wife get the whole property or they go through the entire succession uh, certificate approach for so that to my knowledge i understand it will go because you are joint owners once someone passes away it goes to the other person because you are two owners right right uh, actually 50 50 so if there is no will etc it will go fully to the person uh, the other person so you don't need an noc uh, from the potential possible success you know successors of that person who passed away yeah right all right i think those were uh, questions there are some others which are for the topic we are going to cover today so let's mm -hmm. move on um, to we are not all of us are not traveling now at least i have not taken a flight in the last 6 months uh, or 7 months perhaps but i guess road travel has started and road travel is here to stay so whether we travel uh, you know interstate intercity within the city we travel so road accident one sees one could have been part of it um, you know i think uh, it's nice to hear from you what are the things we need to keep in mind or do specifically including filing of fir or whatever else if we are party to that accident whether the victim mm -hmm. or the causer of the accident what are the immediate protocols what are the things we need to keep in mind and what should we do first so i'm not all of us have gone through something or the other where our car would have gotten scratch i'm not getting into the practical thing of how we handle these like let's avoid the report do all of that i while while when i was looking at this question i thought of what should we be mindful of that we don't realize we've all managed the situation till now i'm not getting into how to manage it what right. i wanted to highlight is basically the first thing if i am in a car accident whether as one or the other i would definitely what i would do is first i would get the photographs today we all have mobile phones let's get details of the damage the injury the location where it happened etc get the name of the person get the id card um, uh, you know to the extent that we can get the phone number and the insurance details what i wanted to mention is which people may or may not realize a lot of times we are driven you know we have drivers who take us especially the older lot or, or whatever there are you know if the car is registered in your name and you are the owner there are a huge amount of obligations on you as the owner no matter who was driving mm. so you cannot get away from that and that is very important to keep in mind because all of us i mean i'm driven all the time so i don't even realize all of this so i think that is one of the points that i really really wanted to mention um sure. and wh why because under our motor vehicles act this is considered a master servant relationship in a very old kind of way yeah. where basically the uh, driver will is working he's like your you know he's working under your guidance he's working under your instructions so you become personally responsible for a lot even if he say drives rash and negligently the court will go into whether he had permission from you or not so there's no way you won't avoid Big that call. yeah so for example if there is a, a grievous hurt or someone has passed away actually um under the law now and then again this also just got amended i think uh, just very recently this year it got amended where again the penalties have gone up you or your insurance guy has to basically for death you have to give 5 lakhs as a standard whether it was anybody's fault if there is a death you have to give 5 lakhs and if there's a grievous hurt you have to give 2 and a half lakhs if they can find you of course if you're not a hit and run if you're a hit and run the government has a fund and they will pay out of that but unless you're paying him through some insurance something etc you have to pay it irrespective of whose fault it is that is something you have to be mindful now you will be lucky if you get off with just this because it's not that if you give this if you give this the guy who's been hit or his legal heirs or whatever they actually can't claim more against you this is final so most of the time what happens is they don't accept this because they are expecting more so you would be lucky if they actually accept this some of the things which i wanted to again mention second point which i thought was important was where are the chances where the insurance company will say acha it is not a liability sure. you know because third party insurance is actually compulsory obviously as everyone knows to get third party it's a you can be imprisoned if you don't have third party insurance right. for your car right so some of the reasons would be 
where you have used it for hire like for example it's a private vehicle you have used it for you know for public use or public transport etc if it's for racing or um, speed testing uh, or if there is no driving if the driver does not have a driving license huge issue huge issue because uh, without a driving license the owner can get imprisoned as well i'm just telling you what the law says it's not actually it may not happen and there are separate things if the driver is going without a license his penalty is different you as an owner are responsible so please make sure that your driver's always got the license uh, then some of the other things is if you dis- obviously uh, you know non disclosure of a material fact etc so then they can disclaim otherwise um, if it's a straight forward process you will basically give it to your insurance guy he will pay within 30 days or whatever and you will close out um in uh, I'm, i'm trying to see if there is anything in terms of ah, one more thing there is when you when you hit somebody it is your response actually a legal obligation to take the person to a, a hospital if they are hurt it is right. actually a legal obligation and you also have to give all the information to the cop i'm not getting into the fact that okay if it's a, it's hit you then the cop will come he'll inspect he will take your car he has to inform you where he's taking your car actually technically unless required he should not be keeping your car for more than 24 hours okay um, but but if but they always say we need it for further investigation still something happens etc that you know how practically that happens i think those were few of the very important points that i wanted to mention there was just one more can i can i take two more minutes please, please. Mm-hmm. there was two more so there there is case law on this that see one is motor vehicles where there are you know imprisonment etc for certain acts for example another one if your car gets hit and the driver is driving they will see whether the car was in fit state if right. it was an unsafe unsafe state it's your responsibility as the owner to actually have got the car repaired etc again the owners will come on you so these things become very important again if you get your kid who's a minor to drive again it's the parent who's responsible so right. all of these um if there is rash and negligent driving or there is a cause of death due to negligence or there is grievous hurt grievous hurt i don't think i mentioned is basically disfigurement of um you know head or face or there is a fracture dislocation eyes gone ear gone etc all of that then other than the motor vehicles act it will also go under criminal uh, law so it will go under the ipc and they have clearly said that um one and the other are i mean they are they're not if, if you get tried under one it's not the same as the other and i'll tell you why because under the uh, motor vehicles act the um the offenses are what you call compoundable which means I, i'm sure some people may have heard of say for example something like plea bargaining which we have in the us right where you can actually negotiate and get out of it if you settle you don't need to now remember in ipc a lot of these where it has death for example they are not you cannot compound them so they are non compoundable which means you cannot the, no you can't settle it you have to go through the criminal process when you as an owner will i mean i'm just assuming it'll be the driver if you're also driving and something happens there's a long process that you got to follow unless they withdraw the case is that an option out they can they can withdraw the case etc court will also look into why and what etc but that happens as you have happens. seen in the yeah. yes yeah yeah i think that's um, a lot of new information at least for me tala yeah. uh by the way is no our car is our responsibility so one question has come up uh, what if you have sold the vehicle and the transfer registry still is underway are you still liable so you should actually you are responsible till the date of the transfer and then they become responsible once the transfer happens okay so technically someone has to be liable on the book so till the trans- you can always say it's not us technically you would not be giving possession of your car till your transfer is complete you shouldn't be is you yeah. shouldn't yeah you shouldn't be but yeah um, like in reality more often than not wo yeah, whatever yeah. it happens yeah. so that is yeah. another point people who are selling their cars and i think now second i mean you just keep selling cars every 3 years and buying a new one one must be and also the insurance also transfers so if you've taken a third party that can also transfer with the car so, 
Sure. So Tala, the other thing I picked up when you were speaking is in the case of death, whether you are at fault or not, you have to, do you still have to pay or you're not responsible? If you, if, if the accident happened and you're not responsible for the death of the other party, but someone dies, you have to pay. it still comes on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to grievous hurt and death. No question of whose fault it was, what happened, etc. You have to pay. Lovely. So now, what happens if I'm the passerby and I witness something? There was a very nice thing that happened actually. Uh, recently, what happened is they realized, and this is, I think, just 2016 or something, that they realized that a lot of people hmm. are exactly for this reason. I don't want to get involved because you're right under our. Uh, process if you see our uh, criminal law procedure code yeah. you they can actually call you as a witness and then you have to go if you don't go you're liable all of that yes so what happened is they got these there's a clause in the motor vehicles act it's lovely actually it's it's called the good samaritan um rules yeah, they sure. call it I about this yeah you read about it. Okay. So under our motor vehicles act there is this uh, provision and there are details otherwise where I, if I see an accident and I feel I need to take someone to the hospital, I can actually take them. Um, even if say I'm a doctor and I try to do something for them, even if I'm negligent, then because I tried really hard, I wouldn't be held liable because I tried to help them up front. Secondly, right. if I take them to the hospital, I can drop them off. Nobody can ask me who I am. How did this happen? What happened, etc. I'm not allowed. And even in fact, the hospital is supposed to treat them irrespective of the information. So that's also another important thing. Um, I don't need to, even if I make a call, I don't need to say who I am. So if I see an accident, I call the cops. I don't need to give any details about myself. All I need to do is give details about the location. Um, right. And I can leave immediately. If I choose to, I can say that I am an eyewitness. And they have to make it very easy for me. It actually says that you should try and make them come only once uh, to give their testimony. Or you should do it by way of an affidavit. Where basically it's like, you know, you swear and you say this is kak, 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 and then you just file it in court. So uh, that was a good thing. Yeah. So next time I pass by and I see an accident, I don't have to be worried. I can go ahead and help. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and help without being worried. We always help, but yeah. with a lot of worry. Yeah. Yeah, great. In fact, if the cops or anyone asks you too many questions, they can be held liable. You can actually go after them saying, why are you asking? They have penalty for that. Okay, I must remember this. Yeah, so that's good. <laughs> that's good, really. So tell me, Tala, do I get away without filing an FIR in case of a car accident? I don't, right? A lot of times, what practically what happens is I'll call my insurance uh, agency. I'll say, do you need an FIR or not for the smaller stuff? If they say, no, you will not file, you'll sort it out. But if they say yes, and obviously for the bigger crimes, for sure, for the bigger offenses or issues, you have to file an FIR. You have to. Um, if we are going to the FIR, I'll tell you a few things which I, I, I think... Yeah, yeah so, cover FIR. This is actually very basic, but I feel everyone needs to know this. You know, you would have heard it so many times. What is a cognizable offense and what is a non-cognizable offense. I'm not sure if that's too basic to discuss here, do you think? Or no, you think please go know? ahead. I think it will okay. not be basic for some of us at least. Yeah. Okay. So cognizable offense is a more serious offense and a non-cognizable offense is a smaller offense. So in a cognizable, for example, murder, rape, dowry, uh, kidnapping, criminal breach of trust, uh, all of that is a more serious one where what happens is because of the seriousness of the crime, the, actually, if it gets reported to a cop station, they can arrest someone without warrant and they, do, they can start investigation immediately. But in a non-cognizable offense, what happens is that you don't really need to, um, you don't actually, you cannot arrest someone without warrant and you need to take permission of the magistrate. You basically need to, so the difference being uh, is that in a, uh, in a non-cognizable offense, you can actually just write a complaint and you can give it, the magistrate will look at it, the magistrate will say, okay, this makes sense, let's go ahead and investigate, and then the cop will investigate, just like in a cognizable offense. But in a cognizable offense, actually, the cop will immediately have to file an FIR. And by the way, just want to tell you, if they refuse to file an FIR, it's an offense on them. Wow. So please be aware of that, actually. A lot of times, why they don't do it, because cops, 
I mean, usually I don't know if there are cops here, but um, but they don't want to go through the process, you know, because the moment you file an FIR, it's their obligation to continue the investigation, to give a report to the magistrate. That's why they don't want to file. Wo file so will be settled. Huh? Wo file will be settled. Ah, well, you know, so then you have to kind of go there and visit some of the cops to do, yeah. get all this done. So they're like, if you can settle it before, that's why they delay, not for any other reason. So what happens is that if, so non-cognizable is, for example, forgery, cheating, um, assault, stalking, and all of that. Um, in a cognizable offense, when the FIR has to be lodged, please remember you must get an FIR number. So... What happens is when you file, there should be a number on the FIR, okay? Because you must have heard of zero FIR. Zero yeah. FIR, have you heard of? No. So in like in the Nirbhaya case, after that it came up where basically what happens is in certain cases like, uh, you know, if there is a rape or something like that, uh, and a lot of cognizable offenses actually, you can file a complaint anywhere. In a non-cognizable, you have to go into the jurisdiction where the event was commissioned. But in a cognizable offense, what happens is you need to uh, go, you can go anywhere. Say, for example, God forbid something happened like that. I can go to the next door station as well. So the reason they give zero FIR literally means the number zero. They will not number the FIR because finally that FIR will move to the jurisdiction of the right police station. Sure. That's why, right? So FIRs must be registered. They also pops what they have is what they call um, a general diary which they have a daily diary so their complaints etc also go into so this numbering is very important you must always have these numbers when you file right um, some of the key aspects when you file an FIR is that we should always be given a copy of the FIR for free it is our entitlement we have a right to file if they don't file you can go talk to the SP or whatever and actually otherwise you can do a written complaint also and file you can even go to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Human Rights Commission, etc. Um, and then FIR has to have a number. Um, there are some FIRs which can be filed online, not all, um, which are like, again, rape, kidnapping, murder, death, etc. Um, if it is a non-cognizable, it has to be in the jurisdiction where... Uh, where the event happens. So why I'm talking about both non-cognitive, even in an accident, it depends on what the situation is. Now, was there death, then it'll be cognizable. Was it just minor, then it'll be non-cognizable. That's why I'm linking the filing of the FIR to yeah. all of that, just to give you context. Um, then once the magistrate gets the report, whether the FIR or the complaint, then he will start the investigation. Sure. Yeah. So is there a timeline for FIR? closure or uh, investigation and do the cops have any uh, responsibility towards the person who has filed the FIR during the time it is open? Yeah, so actually under the relevant statute, your charge sheet, so after FIR there's investigation, if the investigation um, gets completed and you feel yes, you need to uh, you need to start, uh, you know, you need to basically assign some kind of a penalty or you need to identify the offenses. A charge sheet should be filed within 90 days right. from the time that the FIR was filed. Right. So your investigation is about three months. Great. Thanks, Allah. I think we have about eight minutes and uh, we should... Oh. <laughs> yeah, time passes quickly. So uh, I don't want to miss on two points. One, and because some questions have come on, uh, you know, domestic violence. But before we go to that uh, as a question, on property, um, you know, a lot of people when they filled in the form or registered for the session today, they had asked uh, lesser or a lessee, if I'm a lesser or a lessee, what are the top three, four things that I need to remember and be aware of? Okay, I have a very important point to mention for leases per se, which is, which we don't realize is, see, a lease, if it's anywhere above 12 months, actually needs to be registered. Sure. Okay. Um, if it is not registered, and this is whether you're lessee or lesser or whatever, if it is not registered, and if it is for agricultural land or for manufacturing, then it is a year-on-year -year lease, no matter what your lease deed says, Okay. It's a year on your lease, which can be terminated within six months. If it is a, uh, if it's for any other reason, like now, now like residential, whatever, etc., it actually becomes a month on month lease. 
uh, which can be terminated with 15 days notice. Why I'm saying this is, as you know, during COVID, there was a lot of this force measure, this, that, and the other. And one of the things we were looking at is, is your re lease registered or not, if you want to get out of it. Right. Most of us, even I, I mean, a lot of us don't actually register because it's expensive to register. Thank however, yeah. for, yeah, but however, for, uh, because a lease is a big deal. Actually, you pass on some interest in the property. A lease is a solid document. A person cannot tell you, you just get out of a premises if you've signed a lease. Right. They have to follow due process of law. They have to go and file an eviction suit, all of that. So it's a very strong right. Because it's a strong right, what happens is there is process. You have to basically pay stamp duty and you have to pay registration. Um, so that is, um, that is one of the important things. There is everything in a lease, actually, you can put in, a, um, in, in the lease. So there are automatic rights and obligations that parties have, but it clearly says that if your lease deed says something otherwise, your lease deed will stand. Right. So therefore, you can actually decide, but I can run through if, uh, you know, for example, um, the, as a lessee, I have to have possession without interruption. Uh, a lessee can do the repairs. If the guy is not doing repairs, your lessor is not doing repairs, I can do it and take debited from the rent, for right. example. If there are any payments, he doesn't pay property tax, those guys are coming for any reason, I can pay that on his behalf. I can I have the I have the right to remove my stuff when things uh, when I'm uh, vacating. I have the right to remove. I actually can sublease unless it is not um, it is not prohibited. So under law, automatically under a lease, I can actually sublease. So those are some of the things which I would say that is also a small aspect of rent control acts, which are there in basically many states, which are probably not relevant for this discussion unless the property was very old and it's still under that rent, etc. So you have to be mindful of those. There is another law which is also being proposed for that because those rent control properties are really a mess and there's so much litigation. I won't, I think, touch upon that today because I think we don't have time. Sure. I think, yeah, we also in the interest of time. So is that the yeah. reason why 11 months leases are more popular? Does it yeah. need yeah. registration? Yes. That's Absolutely. The and That's the only heard reason. You, yeah, but what I picked up Tala, from the registered leases, it protects the lessee a lot also when you register also, the It protects both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It protects. So yeah. if you are investing a lot in the property, like for example, when we have corporates who are investing a lot, who are going taking long term leases, you know, who are really redoing the fit outs, etc. For sure, you need to do it. For sure. rentals, private rentals, unless there's a big reason, I would say, Achha, this guy is, there's so much of a hassle, you move out and go somewhere else. Sure, sure. That's, that's the practical approach. Right. So, Tata, two more questions before mm -hmm. we have a question, and we are running short of time. Um, so, one is in wills, uh, you mentioned a doctor's certificate, you mentioned there is also a question, you mentioned two witnesses, but I also heard you mention two other things. So, what are the two, three things that you need to put in a will? For it to be valid. One is your two witnesses. Uh, Doctor, Doctor sir, two witnesses, signature, very clear, um, uh, basically, um, statement of what Doctor. you exactly want to do. Very, very important. Um, I would say the most important is don't delay it. <laughs> Go on right. today and do. <laughs> I think that is really the key. Maybe today no 30 will to delay. Yeah, maybe 30 wills get made today, Tala. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so one last question. Maybe it's uh, it's a couple, but the topic is, uh, and this this came up in the during the registration also, uh, protection of women. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Domestic mm, violence want. protection of women. So maybe you cover the rights of women for crimes against women. Whatever are the two three. So things. under I'll, I'll quickly mention uh, under our um, under our IPC we have many specific crimes and crimes for women are actually sorry. Yeah, uh, crimes uh, against women are taken very seriously. For example, if there is a rape, that's one of the exceptions. If there is a rape, I don't need to go file the FIR. Uh, I can actually tell my friend to file it, and the cops are, and it's by, it has to be by a woman officer, and they are supposed to come and take my testimony, for example. I can go actually straight to the hospital to get myself checked so that no, um, no evidence is lost, right? Um, some of the other things, there is a Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act, which, was, which came in in 2005. Where it clearly, you know, it's a very important act because there are certain women who, as long as, and it also recognizes live-in relationships, where basically if you have been with the person, you have lived in the same house in what they call the shared household, 
Um, and uh, there is a very broad definition of what is a domestic relationship. You have certain rights. I'll go through them quickly. One is you have the right to maintenance. Uh, you you can't. So girls get worried that uh, you know. Okay, if I take my children, maybe my husband or whoever it is will file for kidnapping. There's nothing like that because you're also a natural uh, guardian. Um, if, if the cops don't help, you can approach your court. Um, you can ask for custody of your child. um and um, you know there's an order of you can also get an order of protection where you say this guy will not come near me whether to my workplace or somewhere else so you can get that order of protection so there's maintenance compensation custody protection there's a lot of things out there which which are there for the protection so it's a very strong act and women are very scared a lot of the time they are very so that there's a concept of street hun as you know so if there right. is my jewelry there is any of the stuff and you feel you should just take all of that you should take your evidence if you want or whatever that you feel that you need to take and you should get out of there awesome so there is lots in the law as long as we know it yes uh, and we are able to make use of it and activate it at the right time so i think uh, thank you tala for the very very informative inputs and in the chat window a lot of people have said little time lots of uh, yeah you know, i'm so sorry i spoke too much i don't think i could take all the questions sorry about that no but i think it's wonderfully covered tala so okay. and i'm sure each one of the people on this are taking back something or the other from today's session uh, of course go back and make your will as uh, as per tala's uh, advice and inputs uh, and that brings us to the end of the session you'll get a feedback form so please check your mailbox thank great. you tala once again i think thank awesome. you and thank you for saying yes when i approached you uh, really nice and our next session is there on the um, screen you can see it's eat healthy 101 again by one more wonderful a uh, woman with passion and that's on 1st november sunday uh, 6 pm so stay tuned and we'll be back thank you tala once again and thank you thank you bye bye thanks very much bye bye